Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we are going to review a paper entitled Prophylactic Sublay Non-Absorbable Mesh Positioning Following Midline Laparotomy in a Clean Contaminated Field, the Prometheus Trial. Uh, this will be followed by a teaching session by Professor Sababala Subramanian on uh, problems with multiple statistical testing. Perfect. So um, welcome to Crime Surge. Um, so this week or this month, we're going to be discussing uh, the Prometheus study, which looks at prophylactic uh, sublay non-absorbable mesh position following midline laparotomy in clean contaminated fields. Uh, it's a randomized controlled trial published in BJS, comes from Italy, and it was published in April 2021. So now I'll hand over to Gio to give you some more background. Yeah, just a few words. Uh, I'm sure uh, most of you know how common incision hernias are after an emergency laparotomy. They're reported to happen in uh, 5 to 20% of people. Uh, it can hit up to 70% in patients with uh, significant risk factors from smoking, diabetes, to uh, postoperative wound infection. So very, very, very common. Uh, a variety of techniques have been described in the attempt to reduce the risk of developing this type of hernias from small bite closures, to a variety of layers um, and the use, uh, the use of uh, mesh augmentation. Uh, the role of mesh in this context is quite unclear. Um, the evidence seems to be suggestive of the fact that it's safe. Uh, however, um, in a clean contaminated setting, we don't really know. Uh, hopefully this paper will be able to shed some light on the topic. So uh, Paul, back to you, Jack. Yeah, so in terms of shedding light, this is the overall aim of the study. Um, let's see if, if small bite midline laparotomy closure using a slowly absorbable running suture, how that compares to a closure which also uses a sublay mesh in the patient group which we've defined. So if I can think about this more in a PICO format, the P is obviously patients who are having midline urgent laparotomy and we've already said it's for clean contaminated surgeries. The intervention is going to be those patients who receive a mesh supported closure and again that's laid down in a sublay fashion which Gio will show you in a diagram in a second. The control group are just receiving primary abdominal wall closure without mesh and the primary outcome we're going to look at is incisional hernia rate. Uh, Gio if you can talk some more about the methods. Yeah, of course. So this is a double-blind randomized control trial. Um, it is designed as a superiority trial. So it tries to establish whether the use of a mesh is superior to uh, a standard abdominal wall closure uh, in terms of um, incision hernia rates. It's been conducted in a single center in Naples. And uh, patients were recruited between January 2015 and June 2018, and they're randomized to uh, either intervention in a one-to-one -one fashion using blocks. Uh, interestingly, randomization was performed just before the onset of the abdominal wall closure. And patients were uh, randomized, so intraoperatively, to either mesh augmentation, which was positioned in a sublay fashion, so behind the muscles, or primary closure. Not exactly standard primary closure, though. Uh, they use the two-layer small bite primary closure. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. So, ball back to you, Jack. So, for exclusion criteria for this study, so first of all, all of the operations were performed in the A. Rizzoli Hospital in Naples. They excluded patients who were below 18 years old, those who had a life expectancy which was less than 24 months, as decided by the operating surgeon, pregnant patients, patients who have been recently immunosuppressed, and wounds which were less than 10 centimetres, and then of course any wounds which were not defined as clean contaminated. And the paper also states that patients with existing hernias and who did not have a virgin abdomen were also excluded, although we found some issues with this when reading, which we'll touch on later. Back to you, Gio. Right, so let's have a look at their outcomes. So the primary outcome, as we mentioned, is incision hernia rates. Now, how is 
incision hernia rate defined and when? Well, they define it both with clinical examination and ultrasound um, examination. And this uh, is particularly focused on the 24 months outcome. So that is the primary outcome. However, data is collected at three, six and 12 months as well. Uh, further outcomes that they do look at, uh, again, at three, six, 12 and 24 months are morbidity, pain and wound events. Now, when they say wound events, they mean a, a plethora of, of potential complications related to the wound hematoma, seroma, wound tyson, superficial or deep, uh, as well as any interventions related to the wound itself. Um, and Bob, back to you, Jack. Yeah, I'll just add to that, that for the incisional hernia, um, the symbols there denote that they used both clinical assessment and also ultrasounds to detect incisional hernias. So if we start to look at some of the results now, we see that there was a pool of 378 patients initially. After exclusion, they were left with 200, which we were happy with. That satisfies the recommendation based on their sample size calculation. Um, these patients were randomized equally, so 100 in each group, both primary closure and mesh group. Um, there were, we could see here there were some small numbers lost to follow up. So either people missed their clinical and ultrasound evaluation or some patients who were reoperated were then counted as lost to follow up. Potentially, there's an issue here with some exclusion after randomization, which we'll discuss later. The rest of the patients we can see completed the study and they were assessed for both the primary outcome and the secondary outcomes, which Gio has just discussed. I'll pass back to you now, Gio. Yeah, marvelous. So, uh, this is just a quick snapshot of the baseline characteristics of the two groups. As you can see, they are quite similar uh, between each other, as you would expect, given the randomization. However, there are a couple of points that we want to make on this table, and you can see them, um, particularly uh, the presence of, presence of previous abdominal operations, which is reported in both groups. Now, if you remember, we just said a minute ago, this was one of the exclusion criteria, so we're not entirely sure what happened here. And other abdominal hernias are also reported in both groups. Now, obviously, this could be groin hernias, or femoral hernias, so relatively relevant, but it's not clear from the text or the table uh, whether any midline hernias were actually present in either group. So, uh, Bob, back to you, Jack. So I've made this very simple table just so it's a, a bit easier to see. And this is ripped straight from the results, which were in the paper. So this is looking at the primary outcome, which was incisional hernia rate at 24 months. And we can see that in the control group, uh, 21 hernias were found in total. 14 of these were found clinically and then confirmed with ultrasound. And seven were only ever found with ultrasound alone. They were not found on clinical exam. In the MESH group, there were six total incisional hernias found, again, three of which were found on exam and then confirmed with ultrasound, and three were only radiologically evident. Uh, the p-value here is less than 0.02, so they believe there's a statistically significant difference between these numbers. So from this, they proposed in the paper that MESH repair protects against incisional hernia formation. And when they performed univariate analysis, they came up with an odds ratio of 0.27, which was statistically significant. And then performing multivariate analysis, they also found an odds ratio of 0.11, again, statistically significant, which suggests that mesh repair does protect against incisional hernia formation. The multivariate analysis included other variables such as age, sex, BMI, smoking, recent steroid use and diabetes. So I'll pass back to you now, Gio. Of course. So uh, this is just a quick snapshot of postoperative wound events and surgical site infections uh, in the two groups. As you can see, they're quite similar. There's a tendency to develop more seromas uh, in the MESH group. This is kind of expected, um, although the authors do justify the use of a two-layer technique with some dissection between uh, the layers uh, in order to make the two types of closures more comparable between each other in some sense. Uh, this does not reflect in the formation of, of seroma in this particular case. Uh, and as you can see from the rest, morbidity uh, and blood transfusions are pretty similar. One deep infection case uh, was reported in the MESH group and two in the control group. Now, obviously this does have much more severe consequences in the MESH group because the MESH needs to come out. And these patients actually had their intervention for that. So, ball back to you, Jack. 
So both me and Gio have discussed the limitations now. So I've on the left here, I've just got the limitations which the authors themselves acknowledged in the paper. Um, they noted that they excluded wound lengths that were less than 10 centimeters. They acknowledged that their follow-up was limited to 24 months and no further. They described that the closure technique used in the control group was actually multi-layer. Now they justify this by saying they wanted the two closures to be as homogenous as possible, but obviously using a multi-layer closure for kind of midline laparotomy is not really standard practice, so we need to be aware that it may affect the results. And then they also acknowledge that they used ultrasound rather than CT to detect hernias. Um, Geo, you've got a few points we found whilst reading. Yeah, just a few a few other uh, points that we wanted to make, really. Um, so looking at the protocol of this study, they obviously use ultrasound, as Jack mentioned multiple times, to um, assess for the presence of hernias. Now, the vast majority of non-absorbable meshes would be visible on ultrasound, so at least that component of the primary outcome is actually not blinded. Also, you can't really prevent a radiologist or a radiographer or sonographer to write in a report whether they can see a mesh or not. And that report will unavoidably end up in the hands of the clinician that is assessing the patient um, afterwards. So um, I don't think blinding success here was particularly high. And the authors don't really report any data on it. We already mentioned there's some sort of unclear points about the exclusion criteria concerning abdominal wall, hernias, and previous operations. Was, we, we'll ask the authors about this. Uh, the studies that were used to perform the sample size calculations, there's, they mentioned two in particular. They both include a variety of patients, not just the clean contaminated um, procedures, and they also position the mesh in different layers. So in one study, the mesh is positioned interpersonally. Uh, in uh, the other study is um, positioned in an overlay fashion. A lot of hernias here are picked up on radiologically. Um, not necessarily an issue, meaning that if we decide that that is clinically relevant and because those hernia could potentially incarcerate, fair enough. But in an elective setting, we wouldn't really be offering any intervention to a patient that does have a radiologically but not clinically evident hernia that is asymptomatic. And we mentioned already exclusion after randomization was performed in a few cases here. Um, the patients, however, in my opinion, did meet the original inclusion criteria and had the intervention they were supposed to have. So I probably wouldn't have excluded them, but this is obviously uh, something that uh, we can discuss. Uh, Bob, to you, Jack, for some conclusions. So uh, the main conclusion we found really was that the uh, prophylactic mesh did reduce the risk of incisional hernia following these surgeries that were included. And you can just see there in the perspective table, a summary of some of the points which we've discussed in the last 10, 15 minutes. So thank you very much for listening. Right, so um, we're gonna talk about multiple testing. Um, previously, we talked about p-values and confidence intervals. So I'll briefly recap um, that discussion. Um, but if you did want to go back and listen to that talk, um, this might then make more sense. So p-value refers to the probability of getting a result at least as extreme as what is observed if your null hypothesis is true, right? And 95% confidence intervals refers to the interval or the range within which the effect size is likely to lie in 95% of similar studies. So we talked quite um, in detail about these two concepts before. Right. We also discussed hypothesis testing. We talked about the null hypothesis and we talked about type one and type two errors. And I presented this two by two table before and I explained um, what the type one and type two errors meant. So essentially, type one error is the error we commit when we reject a null hypothesis that is actually true. Right. And type two error is when a null hypothesis is false, but the study is unable to reject the null hypothesis. So that's a type two error. And the inverse of type two error is what we call power. So power of the study is one minus type two error, or the ability to reject the null hypothesis when it is in fact false, okay? Now, type one um, error 
is the same as the p-value that we use for statistical testing. And the convention, as you know, is to call a p-value of less than 0.05 as significant. Right, with this in mind, let's just uh, consider an example. Let's say um, we're doing a large cohort study of infection um, after major elective abdominal surgery, and we're interested in looking at variables that might predict um, infection uh, or variables that are associated with infection. And let's say that the first variable as part of the study um, was gender. You looked at males and females, and you looked at, looked at the infection rates in both groups, and you worked out a p-value of 0 0.15. Now, ideally, uh, you want to put down confidence intervals as well, but there's not much space here, so I've left the 95% CIs out. Now, obviously, 0 0.15 is well over 0 0.05, so you would consider this as a non-significant result. So you'd either say um, that maybe there is no difference between gender in terms of infection rates, or you might say that uh, the study is subject to a type 2 error, that it is unable to um, show a difference when uh, or if a true difference actually exists, right? So if you have a p-value of um, more than 0 0.05, you either accept or fall back to the null hypothesis, or you say, uh, maybe you did, you've done a type two error. Now you could look at more variables. Let's say we looked at smoking as well, uh, and looked at infection rates in smokers and non-smokers, and you've got a p-value again of more than 0 0.05. You've looked at um, history of previous laprotomy, and to see if that predisposed to infection and you've got a non-significant result and you can carry on and on. And let's say that then you uh, finally, look, uh, with a particular variable, such as incision here, the type of incision, you've got a significant p-value. Now, when you get a significant p-value, you might say, well, I've got enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis that incision is not associated with infection after major abdominal surgery. Or you might say that you've committed a type one error, that actually there's no difference, but um, the study has shown a spurious difference. Okay. Now, if you're doing multiple tests, you could argue that just by chance, you get a significant p-value. And um, here, if you don't want two, three, four, five, six tests, and you could ask the question, is the type one error rate or the p-value still only 0.05%, right? And that'll be a valid question because you've just done um, tests on as many variables as you could, you could get your hands on. So that's the issue with multiple testing or multiple comparisons. If you've done a single test, the chance of falsely rejecting the null hypothesis is one in 20, which is the type one error or alpha. And it also goes by the name, the false discovery rate. Uh, in other words, you're saying you might have uh, stumbled on a significant p-value when actually no difference exists and therefore you're making a false discovery. So it's called FDR or the false discovery rate. And it all refers to the same concept, the same as type one error, it's the same as alpha. Now, if you run more tests, logically speaking, you're gonna increase the problem of false discovery. You're going to be um, making claims when there really is nothing to do with claim. So with, if with one test, the risk of type 1 error or alpha is alpha, then the risk of not making a type 1 error is going to be 1 minus alpha, right? With multiple tests, the risk of not making any error, any type 1 error in any of these tests is going to be 1 minus alpha to the power of m. So just bear with me, this is important to, to kind of get a, a grasp on the amount of false discovery that can happen if you do multiple testing. So with multiple tests, the risk of making at least one error is going to be one minus, one minus alpha to the power of M. Uh, in other words, what we're saying is that if you do five tests, 10 tests, 15 tests, the risk of making at least one error is going to um, become more and more and more. And this is what some people refer to as a um, family-wise error rate, right? Now, if you want to plot a graph between the number of tests you're doing in your study, 
And this could be a randomized controlled trial or an observation study. Uh, in the example we're discussing, it's, it's simply an observation study of infection after major surgery. If you do more and more tests, the false discovery rate is going to go up and up and up. Yeah, uh, to the point that if you do almost 100 tests, you're extremely likely to get a spurious result just by chance. And um, if you do 10 tests, for example, and you come across so many studies that do well over 10 tests, and the false discovery rate is 0.4. If you do 20 tests, the false discovery rate is 0.64. You're more likely to get a false discovery rate than not, right? And this is a big problem in clinical research. Right, so what are the solutions? So what can we do about it? Now, some would argue or have argued that maybe you shouldn't do multiple tests. Maybe you should just repeat another study for each hypothesis. But you, can, you, you probably realize that that is just not practical, just not feasible. And you can even argue that it's not ethical either, that you, uh, you subject patients, if it's an experimental study, to more and more trials, each trial addressing a single hypothesis. That just doesn't work. Another uh, potential solution is to do the um, tests, do whatever tests you think um, is appropriate, but interpret them cautiously. Uh, that's a practical suggestion, but obviously that's prone to misuse and misinterpretation. You know, what's cautious interpretation for one person would be a bit rash for others. Right. You could um, do a validation study of the discovery. Let's say you've done a study and you've shown that maybe gender, maybe age, and maybe something else potentially is associated with the infection because you've got p-values of less than 0 0.05. And then you say, well, actually, uh, this is an exploratory study and we will have to carry out another study just looking at the variables that have been shown to be significant in the uh, initial study, right? But obviously that'll have to come later. That'll have to be a separate study that you've got to um, conduct on a separate population. And another suggestion, and this I think is extremely valid, is to say that you will plan your study, even if it's an observation study, you'll plan it in detail and you will submit the study proposal to some kind of um, review body, or you might even publish it online. And in the study plan, you will clearly say, what are the risk factors you think you're going to analyze and why you're going to analyze and what's the biological rationale for uh, including those variables. And you will simply stick to it, right? That's um, a very sensible approach. It reduces the temptation for researchers to just stroll through the data looking for interesting variables or any variable that they, they can get their hand on um, and then they look for significant p-values. It doesn't have a fully address the problem of multiple testing, obviously. You're still doing multiple testing. It's just that it is planned. You could do some simple statistical adjustments like the Bonferroni correction, and we'll discuss the Bonferroni correction in a minute. And this kind of adjustment of the p-value will reduce your type 1 error rate or the family-wise error rate. But what it'll do, on the other hand, will be that it'll increase your type 2 error. In other words, it'll make the study less powerful. In other words, you might ignore some really positive findings. And to um, negate that, to reduce the impact on your type of error, there are some complex statistical adjustments that you can do. But I think that's beyond the scope of the stop. Okay, so these are the potential solutions for multiple testing that we've got to think about. Now let's just look at a simple um, correction called the Bonferroni correction. You might have come across this before. Um, if not, you will, I suspect, come across this in many observational studies. So let's just have a, uh, let's see if you can understand what the Bonferroni correction means. And if you get this, then um, if you did want to use this, or if you did want to look into other types of corrections, then it might make things a little bit easy for you. So the aim of the Bonferroni correction is to reduce the risk of your type 1 error, or um, the risk of falsely rejecting the null hypothesis. Uh, in other words, um, reduce your family-wise error rate. So the way you adjust uh, or correct the uh, p-value that, that you get is simply 
take your p-value and divide it by m. And m is simply the number of tests you've done. Okay, for example, if you do six tests, then the p-value for each test, uh, when you're doing significance testing, should be 0 0.05 by, divided by six. Six is the number of tests. That's roughly 0 0.008. So you're aiming for a p-value of less than 0 0.008 before you reject your null hypothesis, okay? Now, if you do that, and in a study you've done six tests, then your family-wise error rate, um, which is a formula we discussed before, um, as is shown in the slide, will be 0 0.047, which is very close to 0 0.05, okay? So if you've done the Bonferroni testing, uh, you can be reasonably satisfied that uh, you've reduced your uh, type one error rate as much as you possibly could. Um, and then therefore, going back to the graph that we discussed, the graph that shows you the relationship between the number of tests you do and the false discovery rate, you apply bond per only correction and you can keep the false discovery rate to 0 0.05 or less, right? So this seems good. However, what's the problem? The problem is keeping the um, type 1 error low comes at a price that increases your type 2 error. Or in other words, the power of your study goes down, which means the probability of ignoring a significant result goes up. Okay, so that's not um, uh, great for a number of reasons. Now, there are a number of other tests, and these are all listed in this slide. These are slightly less conservative in that they don't impact on your power of your study too much. However, they're a bit more complicated, and like I said, you're better off getting some statistical um, advice if you want to do this. Right, so the problem with um, doing statistical adjustments for, for multiple testing is that it becomes a little bit illogical and a little bit silly in some instances. Now, we've just discussed a paper that uh, looked at um, differences between two groups and differences in the risk of incisional hernia, uh, in patients with and without a mesh. And they also compared lots of other variables between the two groups and also between people with and without a hernia. So do we then adjust for all of these baseline comparisons? And if you do that kind of adjusting, then it'll be very difficult to show differences between groups. The other thing is, if you do um, a large observation study and then use the data set for a future study, looking at another interesting sort of hypothesis, what do you do? Do you adjust the new analysis? And do you then go back and say, well, actually the, uh, the paper that we published before hasn't been adjusted and therefore we'd want to adjust it and publish corrections? Uh, it becomes impractical. And what about outcomes and risk factors that are related? So you, you have sets of outcomes that are very related to each other and similarly sets of risk factors that could be related. And how do you adjust the degree of adjust, uh, the, the correction uh, depending on relatedness. For example, if you look at outcomes such as infection, you've got superficial and deep infection. And if you um, add in further outcomes such as readmission, reintervention, quality of life, they can all be uh, very related to each other. And therefore, if you have a significant association between a variable and superficial infection, for example, it's also very likely to have an impact on deep infection and on readmission and so on and so forth. So correcting them, um, correcting the analysis using something like the bond burner correction just seems really harsh. Similarly, if you are looking at risk factors for infection, and um, if you consider a risk factor like smoking, and then another risk factor like poor nutrition or alcohol intake or occupation, again, these are risk factors that are very related to each other, and you get the same problem. And um, if you insist um, and adopt a very rigid attitude towards correcting for multiple testing, what's to stop researchers and authors um, salami slicing the publication? What's to stop people from saying, fine, in this study, I'll report on these three or four important risk factors, and then I'll just do another study and report on uh, another three or four risk factors, um, you know, looking at the same data set. So that'll be a problem. So there are all these problems with, with insisting on statistical adjustments for multiple testing, which is why a number of journals these days do not insist on bond for any correction or other kinds of um, uh, statistical adjustments. Right, so what have we learned? What's the summary? 
So I hope I've, um, uh, I've shown you that multiple testing in observational research particularly is, a, is quite a significant problem and there are no easy solutions. My suggestion would be to plan all your analysis as much as possible a priori and be clear and describe this in your study proposal and try and stick to it when you're doing your analysis. Be transparent about your primary outcomes and your secondary outcomes, your primary endpoints and your secondary endpoints. Be very clear about what, what your um, key endpoint is and what, what your other um, endpoints are going to be. And when you're writing your report, when you've done your analysis and you're putting it all together, um, let the readers know clearly what the effect size is. Um, uh, for example, if you're looking at smoking, let people know what the infection rate with, uh, in smokers um, is and what the infection rate in non-smokers is, along with the p-values and conference intervals. And then the reader can decide, not just based on the p-values and conference intervals, but also on the absolute numbers. And if you've done a lot of uh, multiple comparisons, then explain the caveat. Explain that this is an um, exploratory work and that you've done multiple testings and that when it comes to secondary outcomes, uh, the results, the significant results particularly, have to be uh, validated in further studies. And finally, um, uh, remember that you don't always have to um, adjust for multiple analysis, especially if you made it clear that you plan the analysis and that um, the authors have explained that um, this is exploratory work and, need, and this needs further validation. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.